How far to the right will Italy go? The new face of European politics is called Giorgia Meloni, with her fascist-rooted Brothers of Italy party sweeping to power, overshadowing her hard-right coalition partners uh, Matteo Salvini and Silvio Berlusconi, and routing the center-left, which uh, finished uh, uh, just under uh, 20 percent, according to a provisional tally. Why did voters go for a Meloni, whose allies include illiberal parties in power in Hungary and Poland, along with Spain's far-right Vox? The win spells the end of the national unity government led by former European Central Bank boss Mario Draghi, seen by markets as a steady hand in the face of a COVID-fueled debt crisis and a solid ally against Vladimir Putin's designs on Ukraine and beyond. Meloni, too, by the way, is anti-Putin, but her friends' friends are not always NATO's friends. More broadly, is there a more ingrained trend in Europe? Voter disillusion for one, and this election marked, by the way, by a record abstention rate, and a populist who catches the vibe of voters who want protection from an uncertain world. Meloni campaign on bread and butter issues, pragmatic on the economy, while radically unbridled on social issues, bashing immigrants, Islam, gay rights, and abortion, campaigning as a culture warrior, certainly the winning ticket this time in Italy. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at uh, how the country is going under, will go under uh, Giorgia Meloni. Joining us from Verona, Paolo Borcia, member of the European Parliament from Matteo Salvini's League Party, which is in coalition. Thanks for being with us. Hello. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Francesco Saracino is professor of macroeconomics at the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, welcome back to Catherine Fieschi, director of Counterpart UK, the author of Populocracy, The Tyranny of Authenticity and the Rise of Populism. Thanks for being with us. Lovely to be here. And from Rome, Lorenzo Castellani, adjunct professor of history at the History of Political Institutions at uh, LUIS, the International University. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Yeah, it's a blue wave, a deep blue wave, uh, among the share of parliamentary seats allotted by constituency, the brothers of Italy clobbering all comers, it seems, leaving uh, dregs to their rivals and, co and, and even to their coalition partners. More on that in a moment. Uh, they took seats from the Five Star Movement in the South, from the League in the North, and a divided left in Rome. Carolyn Lambolet has more. Sunday's exit polls weren't exactly a surprise. The right-wing alliance led by Giorgia Milani's Brothers of Italy party now looks poised for a clear majority in the next parliament. The alliance also includes Matteo Salvini's far-right league and Silvio Berlusconi's conservative Forza Italia. The Brothers of Italy party was established in 2012, but it can trace its roots back to the neo-fascist social movement group, which was set up after World War II. The group, which later became the National Alliance, was absorbed into Berlusconi's center-right People of Freedom Party in 2009. Just three years later, Giorgia Milani, along with a few other politicians, split from the party to launch Brothers of Italy. Despite her insistence that the party isn't fascist, Milani does count Mussolini's descendants among her allies. And as a teenage activist, she spoke openly about her admiration for the former dictator. I believe Mussolini was a good politician, which means that everything he did, he did for Italy. Since being established, the Brothers of Italy have seen a steady rise, going from just 4% of the vote in the 2018 elections to winning a 24% approval rating this month. But the party still struggles to shake off its fascist origins. The tricolor flame in its logo is the same one used by the neo-fascist Italian social movement group from the 1940s. Today, the party holds a socially conservative line, opposing gay marriage while promoting what it says are traditional family values. Their policies have also struck a chord with those concerned with immigration in the country. Let it be clear that you only enter Italy legally. You don't enter Italy illegally. There is a serious way of doing things, a so-called sea blockade on the Mediterranean. While the party says it would not push for an exit from the European Union, it does want reforms in the bloc. In sharp contrast to fellow right-wing leaders, Milani has openly supported military aid for Ukraine in its war with Russia. 
Just to give a, a sense of uh, what this election has brought, every time there's a newcomer, five years ago, the last time around, it was the Five Star Movement. And uh, this, these were the first elections, by the way, since Italy reduced uh, the number of national lawmakers from a whopping 900 plus, I think that's a record in Europe it was at the time, to an even 400 seats for the lower <coughs> house. Uh, these are the parliamentary seats uh, with uh, two thirds proportional representation the system. The new system favors parties that enter into coalitions, which the right did, the left did not. And the Senate now reduced to 200 seats. We can show uh, the upper house's uh, standing, which also uh, was uh, uh, skewed in favor, roughly along uh, the same numbers. Were you at all surprised, Francesco Saracino, by these no, numbers? No, no, these results were pretty much in the making. There was a, just a question of how much the, uh, the victory, would, how large the victory would be. There were uh, an issue of whether the right uh, coalition would be able to change the constitution by itself, which, for which they would need two thirds of the seats, which apparently Currently, they will not have. But I mean, th there was no doubt about the defeat of the, of the center and of the right, and it's just a question of how large would be the victory. Uh, is this just a pendulum swing, Lorenzo Castellani, or is this a historic result? Well, um, it's a historic result in the sense that if we look to the last uh, 10 years, uh, it is the first time that uh, uh, a coalition won clearly uh, the election. Uh, and this coalition has a very uh, peculiar element. Uh, uh, the fact that the two largest parties of the coalition are not part of the families that are traditionally ruling the EU. So, of course, there are, you know, some diplomatic uh, problems that should be solved in the next months by the, the forthcoming government of, of Giorgia Meloni. Um, and so it is historic in this sense. Uh, the country is moving very fast to the right, and there's a very clear victory by a coalition. So there is not the traditional process of negotiation among parties towards the center, but a clear majority. Of course, there are differences within the coalition. Uh, the parties have some differences, particularly on foreign policies and economic policies. But uh, it is historical in this sense. Yes, it's something that is uh, that was not so common since the period of Berlusconi in Italian politics. And during the uh, campaign, uh, Giorgia Maloney uh, uh, warning, uh, the phrase she employed at a, uh, a rally last week was, the party is over for Brussels. On election night, however, uh, the winner sounded, well, a note of largesse. If we are called to govern this nation, we will do it for all Italians. We will do it with the aim of uniting people, of enhancing what unites them rather than what divides them. So, Paolo Borcio, uh, what kind of relations then with uh, Brussels uh, in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the rules under which uh, Italy uh, gets uh, that money from the uh, post-COVID bailout? Well, first of all, I was uh, having a look to, to the graphics and I uh, was uh, looking to, uh, to, to the message. Uh, Right-wing bloc against the center, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, center, uh, center left against uh, uh, right wing. Well, in Italy, we use it to, to mention the center right and uh, the, the center left. Uh, there are two, uh, two different aggregations that uh, uh, used to have a normal political uh, dynamics. Well, uh, coming back to, uh, to your issue, well, I think that uh, uh, the new government uh, will, uh, will need to have uh, a very pragmatic and uh, humble approach, but uh, from one side, uh, we, we should be able to, um, to have a look to what uh, is happening to, to Europe, to EU after Brexit. Will it be easy uh, to form a coalition? Sorry? Will it be easy to form a coalition? Well, I think in a line of principle, uh, it, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. I think that uh, a key role will be played by uh, relations with the uh, European Commission, with the European institutions, but uh, we should be aware that uh, in, the, in the past years, uh, European Union was the only economic region at the global level that uh, wasn't able to get uh, the same results of uh, other uh, international uh, uh, actors. So it means that uh, 
something went wrong, some solutions weren't the best ones. And so I think that uh, from one side, the new government will be able to, to have a pragmatic approach, but on the other hand, both the Italian government and uh, uh, European uh, uh, establish, establishment uh, uh, we need to, to find a way to, to open a dialogue because uh, we, we can't hide that uh, at the European level we have some, some problems. Catherine Fieschi? Uh, well, I mean, I'd like to go back to this idea that there's a center left and a center right. It's really interesting because whereas yes, sure. because there's been a, uh, you know, a kind of an agreement, a tacit agreement, uh, particularly in Italy, where, you know, everybody referred to this center right coalition. But in all of the foreign press today, it was quite clear that it was referred to as the victory of the extreme right. Uh, you know, whether it was in the United States, whether it was, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, in uh, France, in, in the UK. So I think it, you know, it's interesting that there's a, there's because, a distinction because, there. Because Silvio Berlusconi is very much the junior partner in this. He's the most moderate of the three. Well, first of all, he's he's moderate, but I think that we shouldn't fall into the trap into thinking he's that moderate. I mean, a few days ago, he came out with, you know, quite the sortie on Putin, you know, only trying to help uh, Ukraine get a decent government, right? So I'm not quite sure that we really should give him that much credit as the wise elder statesman. But they are both junior junior coalition partners, both the Lega and Berlusconi. And I think that that's important because the fact that Meloni dominates this coalition uh, you know, so obviously actually has sent a message to markets and it's, you know, and it's sending a, a, a message to the world. And it will make the coalition perhaps not as straightforward uh, as, uh, as one might think. All right, Maloney's <laughs> win coming at Matteo Salvini's expense, the former interior minister and leader of the Anti-Immigrant League Party, under pressure within his own ranks after losing nearly half his voters... Today, we are commenting on a figure I'm not satisfied with. 9% is not what I worked for. But with 9%, we are in a center-right government in which we will be protagonists. Paolo Borchio, sh should Matteo Salvini remain as leader of your party? Yes, for sure. Uh, uh, well, I think that uh, Italian, uh, Italian politics is very, is very flexible. Uh, things changes in a, in a very quick way, and so actually I don't see any reason for uh, a replacement of the of the party leadership. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'm I'm quite uh, astonished about the, the international press uh, because of some uh, frightening uh, messages that uh, are arriving to to Italy. I mean, uh, this is a coalition that with uh, different. Uh, forces uh, uh, started to, to rule in um, the country in uh, 1994 and uh, I think that uh, well now times are changing uh, there are new leaders but uh, frankly speaking I don't see any reasons to be frightened by the results of um, uh, democratic elections in, uh, in Italy not, not, not about, to be frightened uh, uh, here here is the headline in uh, the French broadsheet of record Le Monde uh, a historic victory of the far right, that's what it says. Yes, but uh, and the, and this the, is a wrong... And the lead editorial, I'll put this to you, Fran Francesco Saracino. This uh, is an, the, the wrong a, message. Uh, a new what? shadow what? over Europe is the headline of the lead editorial. No. Is it a new shadow over Europe? That's a very complicated question. Hmm. Uh, it's much harder to answer than one would believe. Uh, and let me explain. I think that... Uh, on the press, most pressing issues, most notably the recovery and resilience plan, the how to deal with the energy crisis, the, the, oil, the gas price cap, and so on and so forth. On these things, I think the government of Giorgia Meloni will not be uh, much of a nuisance for Europe. Quite the contrary. Uh, there, is a, there is a mutual interest for Europeans to quote unquote normalize Meloni and for Meloni to. Uh, the, in French, they say de diabolise, to show a moderate face, especially because we have a stake uh, around 200 billion of so EU money that we would lose if we had to make major changes. So, in the very short run, I don't expect that to have actually markets prove also to be quite, uh, com quite uh, cool about this election result. On the other hand, where the shadow could be is on a less pressing, but I, I would say even more important issue, which is the 
uh, the, the reform of, the, Eurozone, of the European governance. How will we govern the EU? We have a debate on a fiscal capacity. We have an open debate right now on new fiscal rules. And these are things on which... At the end of which... the unanimity uh, clause, which is something that's uh, an old chestnut, as we say in journalistic parlance, uh, <laughs> that's gone for yeah. good right now? Yeah, I mean, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, but, I mean, on that, I am much less optimistic. On that, I see this sort of Italy getting closer to the Visegrad group, so to, the, uh, to Poland and Hungary. And on that, I, I think Italy could be a, fo uh, a force for conservatorism instead of reform in Europe. On the very in the very short run, I would not worry too much. On the tectonic plates, though, that are moving inside of Italy, uh, Matteo Salvini under pressure. Over on the left, it's worse. The former prime minister, Matteo Renzi's breakaway Italia Viva party, got as many votes as Salvini, except that he got his not from uh, uh, the right, but from the left, from the, Demo from the Democratic Party, whose leader is the first casualty of this election. Assicurerò. In the coming weeks, I will assure the leadership of the Democratic Party in a spirit of service in view of this Congress, a Congress where I will not run again as candidate. Lorenzo Castellani, uh, on this side of the Alps, we're uh, experiencing the death of the big tent parties, the socialists, uh, the Les Républicains. Is, is it the same where you are? Well, um in Italy, we have a sort of decoupling now. The right-wing coalition is a sort of big tent, but with a very uh, strong homogeneity in the sense that the electoral bloc is very homogeneous, made mostly by uh, small, medium enterprises, uh, uh, self-employed, um, and, you know, provinces rather than larger cities. While uh, on the left, the situation is much more complicated. Uh, Letta completely mismanaged um, the alliances before the electoral campaign. So he decided only to just to ally with smaller left-leaning parties rather than to open up the alliance to the five stars or to the centrist as an alternative. So uh, the result was that the center-left coalition was very uh, reduced in its capacity to <clears throat> compete with the, the right-wing coalition. Why? Why did he do uh, this? Well, because uh, the, with the centrists, so there, are, there were differences in terms of political offer. You know, centrist parties uh, were looking for a more uh, reformist, uh, free market their agenda compared to the traditional uh, social democratic agenda of the PD. And the five stars triggered the crisis of Draghi, so it became very difficult to uh, ally with them for Letta's choice. And, and Conte's choice as well. So uh, Letta remained in the midst uh, with uh, a coalition that was not competitive at all. And then, of course, uh, he mismanaged also the electoral campaign. Uh, Letta's electoral campaign was very focused on accusing of fascism uh, Giorgia Meloni rather than promoting uh, his political uh, ideas and, and policies. Uh, and so the result was, was very poor in the sense that he was capable barely to mobilize uh, his own traditional electorate, but not to enlarge uh, the political offer and the involvement of the other voters. Uh, so there was no floating votes for the center-left and for the PD, and a large part of PD potential voters opted for five stars, and this explained also the uh, good result of five stars compared to the polls of a couple of months ago where they were polling 11 percent, and finally they got 16 percent at the expense of PD, and the same was for the centuries, moving from uh, 3, 4 percent to 7, uh, 8 percent. Catherine Fieschi, we heard some people uh, interviewed now. It's probably anecdotal because it's just people on the street, uh, but saying they'd voted left in the past and now voting for uh, Georgia Maloney's party. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that it's important to say is that um, Italy is at a, is at a pit, pretty crucial moment, because the other thing that matters here is how low the turnout uh, was in this election. You really do get the impression that, A, 
um, Italian citizens are, are fed up. Uh, secondly, they've given a chance to one party, they've given a chance to another party. Uh, they're doing what we've seen in a number of other European democracies where essentially um, in the, the kind of the maelstrom of politics means that, you know, allegiances are, are weakening. And I think that, you know, the, the important thing here to keep in mind as well is that Meloni was the only, uh, her party was the only party that remained in opposition uh, during the Draghi government. So she, she played this card of having remained on the outside, of re having remained anti-system, whereas everybody else, you know, was tainted with, with cooperation, which is, uh, which is something that, in the end, let's face it, this perfectly well-functioning Draghi government was brought down uh, because of small-time politics and, you know, people playing games. I think what we're seeing here in Italy uh, uh, is a number of Italians tired of the games, you know, thinking that perhaps giving a chance to somebody who purports to be from the outside, because of course, you know, she's well part of the Italian political establishment, but had remained in opposition, is a bit of a desperate measure. And I think we, sh we shouldn't uh, underestimate, uh, you know, what, what is happening in the, in, in the Italian electorate. All right, people fed up, fed up over what? Well, I mean, I think, uh, first of all, fed up with the sort of thing that's just happened, right? So a perfectly well-functioning government, and then, you know, you have this insider coup, if, if you like. Uh, secondly, I think, to some extent, um, you know, fed up with what they regard as technocracy, right? So uh, a politics that they can't quite understand, a politics that is imposed from above, a politics that feels uh, very much disaggregated from people's preferences and everyday lives. And, you know, Draghi, however talented a politician he was and he is, was never the, uh, nevertheless emblematic of that, right? Uh, Paolo Borchio, was it a, a mistake for uh, your party to take part in that national unity government? Well, to be, to be very honest, uh, at uh, the very beginning, both uh, entrepreneurs, both uh, mayors were uh, very, very happy about this opportunity. They were pushing, uh, they were uh, telling us, uh, come on, you need to join this uh, government, we need uh, uh, Lega ideas. And so, in my opinion, it was uh, a very pragmatic and risky choice. And, uh, well, after yesterday, we, we saw the, the results. Uh, in Italy, uh, people uh, are very flexible in expressing their political consensus. And, uh, well, it, it is very clear that uh, my party wasn't rewarded by this, uh, this, uh, this choice. But I think that uh, sometimes you need uh, to think, uh, first of all, uh, at the, the future, at the interest of the country, and not only to the forthcoming elections. So we are, uh, we are ready to, to restart. It's uh, obvious we are not uh, happy about uh, 9%, but uh, uh, we think that uh, we were very responsible to join this, uh, uh, this project, this uh, uh, drive government. It is uh, not easy for anyone, for uh, both the uh, Democratic Party, for Five Stars, for Lega. And, and what role do you uh, see for a, what role do you see for the League uh, in, in this government? Can Matteo Salvini uh, become Interior Minister again after that showing? Uh, well, now I think it's uh, it's quite early to uh, to give a, a reply to this uh, to this issue. The most important thing is that. Uh, uh, is that uh, Lega will be able to give uh, a good uh, contribution because uh, uh, we are uh, expecting a very hard uh, uh, autumn, a very hard uh, winter because of the crisis of uh, uh, the prices of energy. Prices are uh, increasing, inflation rate is worsening, and so my party would uh, would like to, to give his contribution in order to uh, to keep uh, our country in uh, in, uh, in safer seas. Francesco Saracino was mentioning how all of Europe is watching. Uh, let's first talk about the happy faces. Uh, on his Facebook page, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban posting a picture of himself with uh, Giorgia Meloni. Bravo, Georgia, he writes. Uh, while France's presidential runner-up, Marine Le Pen, took to Twitter to congratulate her trans-alpine alter ego. Bravo to Giorgia Meloni and Matteo Salvini for having resisted the threats of an anti-democratic and arrogant European Union in obtaining this great victory, exclamation uh, point. Um, 
if you're keeping score, and I'm sure you are, Catherine, <laughs> uh, uh, Georgia Maloney and Marine Le Pen, they've not been seen together uh, in public, uh, I believe, since 2016. And sh Marine Le Pen is close to Matteo Salvini and at the European Parliament, but uh, Georgia Maloney's friends are different. Yes, well, they're in separate groups in the European Parliament. Uh, and so uh, Giorgia Meloni is more aligned precisely with Vox, whose Congress... The far-right uh, Spanish far right, party. Far-right Spanish party, whose Congress she uh, addressed not so long ago. And she's also aligned with... Uh, uh, law and justice in in Poland, who are who are really her her closest allies. But I think that you know this goes back to something that was said a, a minute ago, which is that this is where the real worry is, right? The real worry is that I think a number of these parties are seeing their fortunes, you know, change substantially for the better, and that you know whatever prevented them from really cooperating at the heart of Europe uh, all this time, their their nationalism, their uh, you know, personal vanity, personal ambition, et cetera, et cetera. I think that this might very well get eroded because there is the opportunity of lining up Hungary and Poland and uh, the, the, the French and potentially Vox um, and actually create something that is a little bit more stable than anything that they've achieved in the past because in the past their nationalism always got in the way. But this time I think, you know, the stakes are, the stakes are quite high and we may, we may well see alliances and we can see Marine Le Pen reaching out and Orban saying he might be willing to talk. And so I think that the divisions we've seen in the past might well be parked uh, in favor of something more practical and pragmatic at the heart of Europe. Lorenzo Castellani, uh, we're speaking on the day when Hungary's prime minister also again uh, bashed uh, the EU's decision uh, to slap sanctions on Russia despite its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, uh, Giorgia Meloni, who's squarely on the side of NATO on this one, uh, squarely against uh, Vladimir Putin. Explain to us why that is. Well, Meloni um, has never had such a strong ties with Russia. Uh, she delivered some statements in favor of Putin in the past, but she never built up strong relationship with, with Russia. She preferred to remain uh, closer to the Atlantic front. And particularly in the last couple of years, she saw the opportunity to uh, increase uh, her political uh, charisma and her political credibility uh, dealing with uh, the American line and finally to support uh, Ukraine and supporting in particularly the uh, providing of, of arms by the Italian uh, government. So uh, this was the case in which Meloni uh, voted in favor of the supply uh, despite she was in opposition. So it was a sign that she was very on track uh, with uh, American politics and foreign policy. We know that in this government there will be a different position. The league is more skeptical on sanctions uh, and as well as stronger ties with, with Russia. But with these results, um, I don't think there will, there will be a very substantial change in Italian foreign policy. So uh, continuity with Draghi potentially will, will remain. Will there be a problem in Brussels, Francesco Saracino, in terms of uh, uh, that European unity that's been touted by the leadership there when it comes to uh, the invasion of Ukraine? Not, uh, I, sorry to repeat myself, not, not, not in the very short run. I think, I mean, the fact that Meloni is so strong, I totally agree, it, 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 it places her closer to Poland than to Hungary in terms of foreign policy and Poland is of course very much against the invasion so I don't think I don't think there will be problems with that we have to we have some interesting divide in, in Italy about whether for example to, to give weapons to Ukraine but she has been in favor of that so that is likely to continue uh, once again I, I agree if this ex Visegrad group now Visegrad plus something <laughs> <laughs> will uh, eventually get organized and 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 come together with a, with, a, with, a, with a real political project for Europe. Now they're much stronger than they used to be. And they may be in, in the, really in the way of uh, deeper European integration. That is for sure. And so no, don't expect anything 
uh, any any earthquake to happen in the next few uh, months or even years. On the other hand, the process of European reform, both in terms of foreign policy and in terms of economic governance, which is the field on which I work, that I think will be strongly slowed down, so especially because on the other side, the Germans are completely uh, looking inward. So Germany has changed its stance on, on European governance very much since last uh, October in, in the past year. So Germany is now a force for, uh, for conservatism. Now, for very different reasons, Italy has broken ranks with France uh, and so this reformist front has lost one of its legs. Lost one of its legs. Uh, let's to look, take a look at uh, the fact that there's been plenty of carefully worded statements from Europe's major mainstream uh, players. Uh, let's listen to the French prime minister. In Europe, on est... In Europe, we have a certain number of values, and of course, we will be attentive to ensure that these values on human rights, on respect for one another, in particular respect for the right to abortion, for example, will be respected by everyone. Paolo Borchio, is the right to an abortion uh, under threat in Italy? Mm, absolutely not. Uh, well, I have the impression that uh, 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 in, uh, in, uh, in foreign environments, uh, there is a debate that in Italy does not uh, exist. Uh, well, I was, um, I was uh, listening to the previous uh, contribution about, uh, uh, about human rights. I think uh, if, we, if we talk about human rights, uh, it's obvious to, to talk about migration as well. But, uh, for example, in, in, in France, in my opinion, sometimes uh, there is a not a very good memory because uh, uh, we remember in Italy when uh, Monsieur Macron uh, sent back some uh, migrants, some citizens from uh, third countries, uh, but uh, uh, we have the impression that uh, at uh, the international level the debate was uh, with a very different uh, conclusion, because when uh, Mr. Salvini had uh, a restricted approach towards uh, migration, it was uh, uh, considered racist, but uh, it was not the same treatment reserved to Mr. Macron. Lorenzo Castellani, uh, when it comes to the migration issue, uh, a lot of people have complained that uh, the EU should reform its rules under which you have to apply in the first country you, you, you land, that there hasn't been a real resolution of the issue of solidarity when it comes to new people arriving. No, because, of course, uh, um, as it was said, you know, there are national interests that are uh, clashing each other. So uh, the position of every country on immigration is very tight uh, in this moment. It, it was very tight in the last years after the wave of migrants in 2014 and 2015. So uh, also the most moderate uh, governors are very scared by potential waves of, of migrants. Uh, Concerning Italy, of course, this is a particularly uh, important problem also in the public opinion debate for uh, the geographic position of Italy. What we can expect from this government, I don't think it will be a naval blockade or, you know, the promises released by Meloni during the electoral campaign. But what we can expect is a growing activism, particularly in the relationship with Libya. Uh, the last uh, Euro Italian governments uh, did not have time for dealing with a pandemic and then dealing with other problems uh, attached to political economy to focus on, on foreign policies in the Mediterranean. But we know that on this point, uh, mm -hmm. the right-wing coalition is more focused compared to the PD. So what we might expect is you know, a stronger activism of, of Italian government in terms of diplomatic relation or military support to Libya in order to manage the, the flux of migrants. And we heard Catherine Fieschi in that clip from, uh, again, from the French prime minister singling out abortion as an issue. Is it really an issue? Well, I mean, Meloni has made it an issue a little bit. I mean, you know, this is not in the same way that it's become an issue in the United States and not in the same way that it's an issue in Poland. However, Meloni was very explicit that what she would like to do is to essentially, you know, put more money into dissuasive uh, measures and, you know, more incentives for women to change their minds, keep their uh, keep their babies, et cetera, et cetera. And, and why, is this a, this why is this a vote-getter in 2022, restricting well, abortion more in Italy? 
I think two things. One is that you know Italy still is a you know a a, a Christian culturally Christian uh, country. I also it's think that issue. I I also think that it has to do with the fact that you know the the rate of um, the rate of reproduction in Italy is is very very low and therefore you know needs to be needs to be sustained it's something that's part of the national psyche we're not not having enough enough children but i also think that you know this is a woman who's whose uh, slogan, uh, one of her slogans was very much about, you know, God, family, and nation. So, you know, within that, you know, she has made it very clear she's an Italian, she's a woman, she's a mother. So uh, this, is, this is not, um, it's not entirely superficial, but it is also a little bit dog whistle politics. There is a public out there that is sensitive to these family issues, and the abortion issue is is connected to that. And they have put this sort of measure in place in those regions, uh, you know, where they are where they are in government. In Le Marque, for example, uh, you know, these policies to disincentivize people from getting abortions are starting, you know, to to be implemented. So this is the part of the show. We ask an economist to play sociologist. Uh, <laughs> Francesca Saracino, uh, uh, we thought Italy was a country of lapsed Catholics. You know, the Catholics yeah. who don't go to church anymore. Like yeah. here in France. Okay. So, so that, that's really a sociologist question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, of course. And I, I, maybe this is a place where I don't agree too much. I don't think that the divide on this topic is larger in Italy than it is in other countries. And actually, it was a choice of Meloni, by Meloni that was quite strange, because on one side, she brought the issue, and on the other, she said immediately that she had no intention to change, to abolish the law to, or to make the law more restrictive. But on the other hand, as, as she was said a moment ago, simply try to, to, uh, to, to give more opportunity to women who didn't want to do it, which actually, why, why would that be a bad policy in principle, right, if there is no constriction, no, no obligation? So it was a very strange way to do that. Probably, and this, is, this comes a little bit to what we were saying before, given that she knows that on the economy she will have very limited room for, uh, for imposing a mark, she's probably trying to put forward some identity issues that will allow her to characterize herself as something that breaks with the past without really breaking with the past on, for example, the recovery plan and the, 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 the deficit and debt. She has been very moderate, for example, on the, on the perspective of additional deficit, much more than I think she should have been, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and so, so she, she, maybe these identity issues were necessary for her to compact her troops because of the moderate of the moderate phase she was showing to Europeans, to markets, and to and to international organizations. Catherine pointing out that slogan, uh, the mantra, "God, family, homeland." Uh, Sunday, which was election day, there was that open air mass in Sicily given by the Pope, uh, where you could say he gave the Italian far right leader, without naming her, a mix <laughs> of what she wants to hear and what she does not want to hear. Today, I would like to ask for Italy, more births, more children. Immigrants are to be welcomed, accompanied, promoted, and integrated. Paolo Borchio, your reaction? Well, I think on the, on the first point, uh, I, I, fully, I fully agree. We need more, uh, more children. On the second point, uh, well, I, I think that in the, in the past years, uh, Italy did, uh, did a lot for uh, welcoming, for promoting uh, uh, migrants. Uh, I don't think that uh, the same was, uh, was done by, by other countries. And so this could be a very interesting point uh, on uh, which uh, to, to reflect. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, uh, it is uh, quite clear that uh, into the future, the, uh, the pressures from the northern side of Africa will, uh, will increase and so I think that uh, the, the best approach uh, would, uh, would be the approach to promote uh, international uh, cooperation, aid cooperation, because uh, I don't think that uh, it will uh, be feasible to, 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 to elude these uh, this poor people that uh, in, in Italy and in Europe uh, there are uh, opportunities for, uh, for everyone. I think that uh, 
especially on the climatic point of view, especially on uh, promoting uh, renewable energies, uh, the, the most important topic uh, uh, would be to, to try to, to enhance uh, and to give new opportunities to, to Africa. Uh, Lorenzo Castellani, uh, we come back to the question we asked you at the outset now. You heard uh, Francesco talk about how uh, the new governing coalition will have its hands partially tied when it comes to uh, economic policy, uh, that really these identity politics issues are perhaps uh, being stressed uh, to uh, offer something different. So again, <coughs> how historic is this vote? How much... Uh, uh, do again. I show this this newspaper I showed earlier. Uh, are countries like France, uh, the governments in countries like France, supposed to worry? Yes. First of all, just a reflection on uh, the ethical issues. Um, Italy is not a, a common country in the sense. Uh, Rome is the capital of Catholicism uh, since its foundation. So. Uh, basically, the influence of the Vatican on these issues is extremely powerful. We had PD in government nine years on 10 in the last decades, and it was not possible to approve uh, gay marriages or any other progressive policies. So uh, in terms of propaganda, the progressive attempt to impose their own agenda, but definitely was not possible in practical terms. So um, what we can expect for, from, from Meloni on this point is just to, co to preserve what is still there, not moving uh, a step farther in terms of expansion of civil rights, but nothing more. I think she is, on this point, a conservative, not a reactionary, but we have to consider that Italy is always very influenced by Vatican position on this point. Uh, independently from uh, the prime minister and the color of the government. Um, what we can um, experiment is a transformation, basically, of these national conservative forces. Uh, until a few years ago, and Italy was a great laboratory, these forces were anti-establishment and anti-euro. Now they are not anymore anti-euro. They are for sure euro-skeptical and nationalist, but they are substantially changing their minds, particularly on the economical issues. So uh, I completely agree with uh, Professor Sapraceno that is very likely to see a mix between uh, a sort of identity politics, uh, not so pronounced in pragmatic term, but very strong uh, at rhetor a rhetorical level, um, uh, of co uh, combined, of course, with some other elements, as uh, fighting uh, crimes, uh, imposing a law and order, or you know, defending sovereignty, particularly through uh, some economic protectionism uh, to uh, some industrial sectors of, of Italy. But definitely, um, there is not so much space for political economy because there are many ties. So it's a strange combination between you know, uh, right-wing, hard right-wing position uh, on uh, all the other issues, but a more moderate posture on EU relationship and uh, economic policy. Catherine Fieschi, um, it's a question of uh, how strong institutions are. You have to build a coalition in Italy. Uh, we've seen with Viktor Orban's Hungary where he didn't need to change the constitution he, but to, to be able to, to have this more illiberal bend. From this conversation, it sounds like the institutions are stronger than any one person in Italy. Is that true? Well, uh, I think so far it is. I think in part because um, they haven't got the numbers to, uh, you know, unilaterally change uh, the constitution, to change the role uh, of the president and, and, and so on. So I think I, I agree with what's being said, uh, you know, across the board here. One thing that I think we need to keep in mind is Meloni is in this, uh, she's playing a long game. This is what differentiates her, I think, from a lot of the people who have come before her who were, it's a little, was a little bit of a vanity project and <clears throat> personal ambition. I think that Meloni has, a, you know, personal ambition, but I really do think that she's looking for a long-term transformation. She's looking for stability, um, and therefore we aren't going to see her, you know, upset the apple cart uh, immediately. And we will have that game of two halves where, you know, she's going to try and achieve as much as she can in terms of economic stability, get what she can from Europe. But at the same time, she does have a problem because she is really a nationalist and she will 
um, she will come, you know, she, she will take on Europe's reformist bend, right? And so she will clash with, uh, with Europe at some point, but not right away. Not right away, not with uh, unless that she gets a two-thirds majority, which was not the case uh, this time. Uh, Catherine Fieschi, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to thank as well uh, Paolo Borchio for uh, being uh, with us uh, from uh, Verona. Also want to thank uh, Lorenzo Castellani in Rome, Francesco thank Saracino. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.